So what episode is this? Is this uh, 46? 40 something. Excellent. Does it matter? Well, not really. Well, it will do. When we get to 1,000, we'll want to know, won't we, whether on 1,000 or on 1,001 or we're still only on 999. So we may as well um, keep a track. If we don't keep a track now, then we'll never know, will we? That's a very good point. Okay. So, welcome to the Dental Fusion podcast. We've found the lead to the uh, video camera, so we have got some video. Uh, and uh, I've got, if I press that button, I've got a screen recorder going. So, uh, uh, we're surrounded by technology. And on the line, I have got Chris Ritchie, freelance journalist and author. Uh, no Richard Lishman this week. We think he's abroad. We think he's abroad, don't we, Chris? We don't know. Yeah. He but might be in prison, he might have had to turn himself in. or He's got a foreign dialing code on his phone. So his phone may have been stolen and ended up in Romania. Or he might have bought his new car, if you were listening last time. He might have driven it off a cliff somewhere. Now I'm, I'm sorry he's not here, because um, after we went off the air last time, we both found out that that car cost about £81,000, didn't we? Ooh. And that's before you start putting in the, um, you know, t- video in the seat backs and uh, the um, anti-collision radar. The machine guns as well. <laughs> the come, machine guns. Come out the front. So, Torpedoes. Um, I wanted just to clarify with uh, old uh, Richie Rich whether how much he spent on it. Because um, I don't think he mentioned it last week, did he? No, oh, well, it must have Surprisingly been. Surprisingly quiet on that. It issue. must have been at least the uh, the suggested retail price. So yeah, someone is paying him far too much, and considering he's at the top of the tree, he's paying himself far too much. Well, it may so. be a company car. You see, that's the other. I mean, it may be a company car, and I mean, being and working in money, you see, you may have contacts. These money people have contacts that know how to get money. I mean, he knows yeah. people who know how to get money. I know that, but. Contacts may, in, in Russia, you mean? And, no, I'm thinking more contacts in car leasing, you know, who can uh, oh. get him a very good deal. Not just a very good deal, a very, very good deal. So not the mafia, then? That's not what you're well, saying? Well, it may be mafia, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. The last time, I've never bought a new car. No, I did buy a new car once, I think. It was a Ford Sierra Gear. That'll tell you how far ago that was. And um, I drove it for 13 months and then totaled it. <laughs> Crashed it in the snow and... And wrote it off, so I vowed never to buy a new car again because it had depreciated so much in the 13 months that uh, I'd had it. I've always bought second-hand cars. I buy a car, typically I buy one that's got about 30,000 miles on the clock, which is about the time that they're traded in because they, they're not um, they're, they're still in reasonably good condition then, you know. And, um, mm. and then I drive it until it's got about 100,000 on the clock and then I think about buying another one with 30 on. What do you do? Well, I wouldn't know about that, but I do apply the same logic to how I choose women. So, I'll just go with that. What, you wait until they're 30 and then... No, I wait till they've done 30,000 miles. Right. And then what, and then you get rid of them when they turn 100. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really mind how old they get to. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, the, the rapid depreciation of your gear was probably due to you totaling it in the snow crashing it yes yeah that can have a effect on the value of a car actually i haven't discussed it with anybody since it was a very traumatic period in my life but (laughs) um let's talk let's keep talking about that then i remember going to um look at it when it was towed away obviously and i had to go to the uh scrap heap and uh, get a few bits out of the car which they'd taken out and uh, I stood there looking at it, and it was T-boned. Someone went straight. Someone was coming down a hill in the snow and couldn't stop and T-boned the car on the passenger side, um, yeah. much to the surprise of my wife, who was sitting on the passenger side at the time. <laughs> but I escaped, uh, I'm pleased to say, mainly by managing to skid the car so that uh, the passenger side was the side that got the um, the largest impact. But um, I was looking at it in the scrapyard, and I remember saying to the guy, you know, because it was still like a relatively new car, the new model, you know. It was must have been one of the first that was written off. And uh, I said to him, you know, that's a lovely car, that is. You know, if you're thinking of buying a car, that really is a lovely car. And he, and he took one look at it, and he said, yeah, it was. 
<laughs> and I thought, oh no, cruel, too harsh, too harsh. You know, I just lost the car. I mean, you don't have to rub it in that badly, but yeah. uh, you, you know, you lost your dignity as well that day. Then uh, I'll tell you what I did. I lost my love for cars that day. My my love affair with cars died with that car because um it just came across to me that cars were a point you know way of getting from a to b and uh as long as they had a radio and a heater i didn't really care <laughs> so uh, and which is a shame because richard's a car nut tony reed who i'm hoping to speak to is a car nut isn't he a vintage motor enthusiast as they don't think they call themselves car nuts do they um and um my my brother-in-law is uh owns and drives a ferrari uh, and um, I don't think he had to sell his Lotus when he bought it, so you can imagine what he's like with cars. It's very um, difficult to drive two of them, though, isn't it? And I can't talk to any of these people on on a you know. It's a bit like um, I was in a taxi the other day, and I just asked the taxi driver if England had won their World Cup qualifying match, and he said, "You're talking to the wrong." wrong bloke mate he said i had that steven gerrard next to me for an hour and a half and i didn't know who he was he said we spent an hour and a half we spoke about everything the weather the state of the economy he said but not a word about football he said he must have thought i was the best taxi driver in the world <laughs> not, not bothering about his football but he didn't well, he couldn't talk to me about it. he thought i was a football nut and he apologized and now when i go to a party and bump into my brother-in-law and we stand there sort of just looking around because all he can talk about is cars and and he knows that what I know about cars is really not not worth bringing up. Well, considering how little you know about cars, we've spent, I think, the last 25 minutes talking about them. So, yeah, talking about the fact that I don't know anything about them. So anyway, sure. let's move on to something dental then, OK? Because the, the, yeah. the, the uh, thing that uh, I think is probably most relevant perhaps to the audience of the podcast at the moment is... Well, one of the things is the changes going on at the British Dental Association, and uh, they are—they're not above having a bit of a crisis, are they? The BDA, um, when well, necessary. Well, the the old Peter Ward la 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 I'm not listening crisis was oh, God, was yeah, good. That was funny, wasn't it? La 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 la. la. Is it zero or not? No, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. If you're going to try and trap me, I'm not doing I'm it. not trapping you. You told me that there was no... No, no. You told me that there was no mercury vapour released from an amalgam filling. No, I'm not doing this. You're not doing what? Answering the questions that we told you we were going to ask you? No, you, you didn't tell me you were going to do it that way. But what, what's going on here is, is this membership levels thing, which is confusing everybody, isn't it? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think they've made a classic mistake here which is that when you do a private conversion which i think is pretty analogous to what they're doing what you do is if you want to do it wrong then you put the fees up and say to people we're going to put the fees up but don't worry it's going to be fantastic you're going to love it it's going to be uh, so wonderful after afterwards you'll be you won't care about the fact that you're paying more and um and of course people think well i all i know is that the fees are going up i don't i don't I haven't really experienced the um the service that you know that you're promising so on the one hand you've got a, a known which is a known increase in fees on the other hand you've got an un you know possibly a possible increase in um in uh, quality of service and so um, if you try and do a private conversion like that as a dentist, you will fail. What you have to do is you have to put the quality of the service up first. You have to deliver on everything that you want to and possibly run at a loss and then go to the patients and say, look, as you've probably noticed, we've completely redeveloped the surgery. We've taken on new staff. We've got waiting times down. We're using white fillings now instead of silver. And as you can appreciate, it is costing us more. And we're going to have to pass some of that cost on to you. But we think that now you've experienced the, you know, the, the new improved whatever, you'll uh, agree with us that it still represents good value for money. And nine times out of ten, the patients will say, yeah, I like it here. I have noticed that you're doing things a bit better. And OK, so you've had to put the fees up after a few years. I, I understand that. But the BDA have done it the wrong way around, haven't they? They've they put their fees up. I, I can't remember exactly what they were charging before. It was in the order of about 500 or something. Mm. And now 
members have got, or they had, two choices to pay more, which is to pay nearly 800, 795, or to pay nearly 1100, which is, you know, the expert is 1095, or drop down to 295, but accept that they are really, that's just to use the website. It's a it's a hands off approach, you know. It's not don't ring us, don't email us. You're it's a self service BDA if you like. Mm. Uh, so, and I can see how they've stratified it, and because uh, but what they've done also, if they they've you know to try and justify the the increased cost, they've included a lot of things that people really don't want, or, or most of them probably don't want, which is things like the um, three day conference passes. Because if you're an extra member at seven ninety five, you're paying for a three day conference or pass to a conference that you may not may not go to. Yeah, that is um, what what it strikes me that you you already pay your GDC money, and that's that's an organisation that you can't really get a straight answer out of very quickly. So you might as well not go with the essential package. The extra package it seems a lot more and. I don't understand the jump, really. And yeah, as you say, who, who's who's to say everyone's going to go to this conference? It's, well, uh, I think I've the been... extra is really targeted at um, associates, and you know, in just the way that the, 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 the people think about this, it's extra is associates, isn't it? Expert is principals, and they're coming under, I think, so much pressure from other organisations that are doing the member support role. Um, you know, you can argue how much this is due to their sort of failure to impose their policy direction on on the profession nationally. But so much of what dentists want now is just simple check box ticking approach. You know, we've got the inspector coming in. Is there a series of protocols for this? Can we buy the protocols and stick them on the shelf? So when the inspector comes in, we can say, oh, yeah, if you want to see the blah policy, there it is. It's all up there on the shelf. Now I'm sure the BDA does does do some of that, but I think they're getting you know people like Smile on and and people like Seema Sharma at uh, Dentabite are probably doing it better. And mm. given the choice, and I have to say that obviously we're facing the same problem as the BDA in that respect that nobody wants to join an association on principle. Really, nowadays they want to know how it's going to help them in their their workplace. And so inspection and testing and compliance has become such a big part of being a dentist now that um, the, the question really for a principal is why would you want to have to pay for an inspection, testing and compliance package and then join the British Dental Association on top of that, however much of a trade union they say they are, however much they say, yes, you can borrow books from the, the library, the library. I mean, who, who the hell borrows books? books from a postal lending library anymore <laughs> you know now you know hello the internet's come along and mm. uh, and the british dental journal which is such a dire magazine that when when i was a bda member which i think i was for a few years i mean it got it, it just got i don't think it even got unwrapped they got stacked they do, do get i've been in very many dental surgeries where you go into the dentist's office and you'll see a massive great pile of british dental journals stacked in a corner because they're very heavy and you have to stack them in a corner otherwise after a few years they'll fall over and kill you <laughs> and you say well what are they and they say well that's all oh that's the british dental journal i must get around to reading those one day and you think well you need a fairly hefty yeah. spell in prison to have enough time to be able to read that lot it's a, it's a very academic leaning for that journal, isn't it? It's not a magazine in in that sense. And it's very text-heavy. I'd say I don't think I could probably get through a page of it without falling asleep at least three times. And, yeah, I think it also comes out, uh, it's the frequency, is it bi-monthly or monthly? I mean, I, I don't know. I can't remember. I think, it's, I, I think it's monthly. But, but, it, they, but it, is, it does offer it does offer CPD and it's very easy CPD. I think you don't even have to get the questions right to get the the credits. So pe people join the BDA because they come out of dental school and it just it well certainly for years and years it was the done thing, wasn't it? You you come out of dental school, you join the BDA, you're part of the union, and they take care of everything else. But uh, as you say, the the times have changed. 
what what exactly do you get from the BDA now apart from the 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 CPD the BDJ that you won't read um, you know what else is there well I, I have I tell you what I have got and that's literally I've got a card through this morning because um so many people have resigned over the fact that they didn't want to pay what they effectively they see as more for the same level of service that uh, they're talking about figures of 10% of the membership lost and that means that they're going to have to recruit an awful lot more people onto their lower tier which is the 295 tier um, and um, they've got 20, 24 copies of the BDJ this is what they get so it must be uh, two a month yeah um, 12 copies of BDA News, uh, a, a way of recording CPD online, 5,000 pages on the website, Ooh. discounts on books, trade union membership, borrowing rights at Europe's largest dental library. Actually, I would pay good money not to have those. <laughs> uh, an associate contract checking service, download over 170 e-books. I'm not saying there's not any value there, but I'm just... I I I mean, from our experience... Basically, people are pretty good at solving their own problems, and if they want a book, they'll find a book. But what they want from a membership association is to be able to ring up and talk to another dentist and say, yeah. you know, this patient's driving me mad. How do I handle it? And they value the sort of the personal service that we've always provided, the one-to-one, -one, very sort of bespoke, tailored um, problem-solving approach. And the British Dental Association was bad enough before this change, when they you, you used to ring up and you wouldn't talk to a dentist, you may you may talk to someone who's had some training in the sort of problem that you've got, but it wouldn't be a dentist, so they wouldn't really understand uh, where you're coming from. I don't know, perhaps emotionally as well as just um, technically. Um, and one of the side effects of this ten percent reduction in their budget is that they're going to be making about twenty percent of their staff um, redundant. So it's going to be interesting to see how they're going to argue that uh, the increased expense, you know, your thousand pounds, eleven hundred pounds they're expecting you to pay now, which is pretty much double what you did before, how are you going to get a better service for that if um, you, you know, you've got only 80% uh, of the staff? And Eddie yeah. Crouch has resigned, Eddie Crouch has resigned from the, the Principal Executive Committee apparently over it. Um, they're looking at about a three thousand, uh, a three million pound loss. Now, I dare say, you know, I mean, they'll say, oh, well, well, we'll be back in profit again next year. And they probably will because it is, it's a license to print money, the British Dental Association. But, um, it's, you know, I just, I've always had the suspicion that the British Dental Association exists to support the British Dental Association and not, ne not necessarily the members, you know. Yeah, well, there's, there's two things here, as you said, that you, you're not disputing that there's value, but most of the things you listed off that card are literature you know it's a lot of reading that they're offering for 1100 pounds you can read all this and again the internet is there and dentists do not have time to do all that reading you know they're staring into the the abyss of the mouth all day long and they come out the last thing they're going to want to do is read 5000 pages online and two magazines a month that's just too much. And so £1,100, yeah, there's value, but it's value if you want to bore yourself stupid reading and reading and reading every evening, which you don't, you know. And also, one has to wonder why these this, this price uh, difference thing has come up because, you know, what, what's, what's the reason? What is the, the trigger behind putting a package together for 1100 quid? Any ideas? Well, I think that, I mean, I, I don't know, but running a, a membership association as we do, I think what happens is a very, very small proportion of your members tend to use up most of your resources. You know, very, very many people just get the magazine, you never hear from them till they, re they retire, in which case they then resign. Um, a lot of people... Um, take up a you know cost a lot of money and it is tempting to say well well perhaps we could charge them more you never think oh we'll just charge the majority less but think well perhaps we can charge more to the people who use more and they're under a lot of pressure i think from the everybody to be everything 
So people don't want to spend money on Dentabite or Smile On or whatever if they can avoid it. They'd rather the, Brit the British Dental Association did everything and probably quite forcefully say, you know, you're our association, I think you, you should be providing X, Y and Z or compliance or advice on HTMO 105 or whatever. And um, they've said, and what they've done, I think, is something very similar to what um, Dental Protection did about 10, 15 years ago, which is have a risk-based approach to subscriptions. And DPL went from charging everybody one price to saying, if you have a claim, you go up a, a tier. If you have two or three claims, you go up a few tiers to the point where we could take any one type of member and say that taken as a group, a group within a group, if you like, they're self-supporting. So the high maintenance people are self-supporting. The low maintenance people are also self-supporting. And of course, the whole idea is that uh, uh, if theoretically that works, then then everything is still self-supporting, even though you've done a tier. But I think they've taken they they've forgotten that dentists love gaming systems, as the politicians keep telling us. And so I, from a personal level, I think they they didn't really probably pilot it. Give another lesson that could be learned from another body. Um, and they didn't really take account of how dentists are going to look at this proposition. And the way that it, it looks to a dentist, I think, is you are going to get the same or certainly no more than you got, but you are going to be expected to pay £800 for it now, at least. Mm. And, um, and if you want all this practice, inspection, testing and compliance stuff, which costs us money to produce then we're going to charge you 1100 quid. And what you have to do is you have to think, well, the extra £300 is only what I would spend on a, an inspection and testing compliance package anyway. So um, I'm, I haven't lost anything because I, you know, I can cancel my um, subscription to my compliance people. And what, but, but um, if you think of Adobe uh, now, uh, Adobe make computer programs that for creative people who do writing and make, and make create websites and movies and audio and stuff like that and they went from a system whereby you bought a program and then after two or three years you upgraded it to now you you sort of rent the programs and you rent them all you pay somewhere between 20 to 40 50 pounds a month and that gives you access to all the programs now what that means for us is that okay we get access to the latest version of the two or three programs we use but we also get access to the latest version of 17 programs that we're never going to touch in our life because I'm not going to go into cinematic post-production or animation uh, or, or produce flash movies uh, or you know so uh, in from a purely human point of view looking at that I'm thinking to myself I'm paying for all this stuff that I'm not going to need and I can see why the dentists are looking at the BDA and saying okay i've got a conference ticket um and jenny pinder made this point on gdp uk and it's a good point okay so you're giving me a free conference ticket and you've given me two free conference tickets for two members of staff so that's three um hotel rooms unless you get very lucky in which case it might be one uh but three three yeah well okay well, i had to do it didn't i it's three hotel rooms uh over three days so that's uh, six nights possibly nine nights in a hotel then and travel and subsistence and that's not counting the opportunity cost of not being in the practice so you're looking at 1500 pounds for your free ticket minimum minimum so uh and Hello? When, yeah yeah i'm here yeah yeah sorry you dropped out completely there so when when uh analyzed in that way it doesn't look to be such a quite a good bargain does it no well i wouldn't have said it would look like a bargain at all like they, as, as i said earlier you've already got to pay your money to the gdc when they put their fees up very controversially didn't they by 33 percent and you've got this huge price hike i i think they, as you said at the start there's no actual demonstration yet that the service has improved uh, over at the GDC, certainly, what, what has improved? Is, is there any sign even now that that money has been put to good use? Uh, you know, the, the BDA has made a decision. Maybe it'll pay off, maybe it won't. But I think the majority of people, when they see that they've now got to pay double what they were before, 
are going to really ask the question. You know, I think they will say, do we really need this? What does the BDA do for me apart from put loads of paper in my lap every month? Well, I think it's a shame because I think membership, oh, there is a place for membership associations and uh, for the sort of the um, intangible things that they can do for members, not really based upon inspection and testing and compliance, but things like, um, you know, even emotional support and uh, encouragement, uh, networking, all those sort of things. So I, I do hope that dentists don't stop joining membership associations, uh, whether it's the BDA or the DFO. Now let's go on to uh, the second story. I think we've done that one to death. Uh, and that's Oasis Healthcare. Now, Oasis Healthcare is in um, the hands of uh, venture capitalists, isn't it, as most corporate dentistry bodies are. Yeah. And they have needed a chairman. And who have they gone to? Who, can, who would be a high-profile trophy appointment for that sort of job? And the answer is Sir Stuart Rose, formerly of Marks and Spencers, widely accepted to be retail god, mm. um, is now chairman of Oasis Healthcare. Now, I know it's only one of the things he's doing, but I'm sure he's not just doing it for the crack. You know, he's, I'm sure he's going to be looking quite closely at how, how Oasis is, um, is developing. And, and I'm sure he doesn't come, you know, for a £10 an hour and a bacon sandwich either. Or, or crack. I, I didn't know that he anyone did that sort of job for crack, but thank Thanks. you for bringing that to my attention. So, uh, yeah, th he's, this guy... Um, he's, going to, he's going to be uh, a force, isn't he, in dental corporates? I mean, th this is a sign that they're really... Th th that the whole battle between the corporates is hotting up now, isn't it? They're, aren't they not bringing in the big generals now, aren't they? Yeah, well, it's just the way it's all going isn't it you know the the corporates have to expand they have to keep going it's just like anything and any capitalist venture has to keep on going like where where i live there's um walton bridge it's a very famous bridge and there've been uh two replacement bridges over the last 50 years or so and they finally decide to build a new permanent bridge but i'm sure it can't be permanent because at some point there will be a need for a contractor to come in and build another bridge. It just the, the it never stops, does it? You know, but all of these things go, and that's how I that's how I view anything that happens in business. You appoint someone, you create a new product, blah blah blah, and it's all generally the same stuff recycled that was happening twenty, thirty years ago. Um, you know, but. Yeah, in in terms of what this means for dentistry, I I'm not sure that it means a hell of a lot. I think that it's just a company expanding and expanding and expanding until one day it'll rule the world. You know, I don't think that's a big deal. Do you think it will, or do you think it's exp they're going to expand until they just turn into a Southern Cross and blow up? No, I I I don't think it. Well, you know, there's always a danger that that you've got a bad egg somewhere. But the, the difference is, if you've got a bad egg at the top of an organisation, then that drip feeds down. It's like an oil that then covers everybody underneath. But this chap is not, uh, you know, well, I don't know him personally, but so someone with his track record doesn't appear to do business in, you know, cloak and dagger way. And so it, it would appear to be a very good appointment from certainly from the point of view of Oasis and not its competitors you know what what's next will Richard Branson get involved something like that well I think uh, Bridgepoint that owns Oasis um, it looks like um, Stuart Rose is um, on the board of Fat Face and I, if I remember correctly I think Bridgepoint owned Fat Face so it may be that they just they have him on um, a sort of a retainer to advise them across all of their purchases yeah and and he's he's the right man for the job isn't he for you know going from what he's been doing he certainly appears to be a very very shrewd acquisition 
Okay, right. Well, I'm not quite with you on that. I think it's pretty significant. I think that the day, I mean, dentistry, you're always used to dentistry being second division, possibly third division in everything. And the day that a dental company gets Sir Stuart Rose as its chairman, I think is, is pretty significant. It shows that we're, we've been promoted somewhere. I'm not quite sure where. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in terms of the amount of profit they think that we can produce or the uh, amount of capital they think that they can realize on the sale of the group or something but they you know, I think he's he's a premier league player and uh, to see him in charge of dentistry I think is quite quite good fun and I'd be interested to see how where that goes yeah well, d- dentistry is going through big changes you know the the Tesco uh, now opening up practices in there aren't they and and offering nhs and private so you can go and do your shopping and then you can go in and have a few implants and boots of course were involved several years ago weren't they you know that there there have always been efforts to uh combine retail and dentistry and you know this is i think just another sign of that but no, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you i think this this is a very very interesting development and you know but where where can they take it you know it's not like they can sort of do anything more than 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 dentistry is you know they can't change dentistry dentistry is dentistry yes yeah well i suppose dentistry has changed quite a bit i'm thinking more of the fact i mean you talk about tesco's that was integrated dental so we've on the one hand now we've got integrated dental going into tesco's already a massive chain Oasis. I mean, perhaps there's room for both of them, but um, I think it's an escalation in the, the battle for uh, market domination. Uh, and the, the small guys, you know, you can either you can look at it one of two ways. You can either say, well, the small guys will get squeezed out of this, which they almost certainly will. Um, and and uh, we're talking about the, the the sort of the medium-sized practices, not the, the one, not the guy the BDA is giving a free conference ticket to one dentist, two nurse, well, you know, one dentist, one nurse room, one receptionist. I'm talking about the guys who've got the bigger building, perhaps in, in near the city centre, um, and possibly four dentists working there, six dentists, something like that. And these are the guys that um, are being bought up. Um, and that, and you can you'll you still be able to go into dentistry small, you know, and make a reasonable living. Probably not brilliant, but um, uh, I don't think you'll be s- squeezed out. But the, perhaps the, the guys in the middle tier will be squeezed out. But they won't be squeezed. They'll be bought out. You know, they'll be offered. They'll they'll retire. The boss will retire with his million or whatever, his million and a half, and um, and he'll he won't care. And um, the the corporates then it'll be up to them won't it to make these medium to large size uh, surgeries a success which they'll probably do through economies of scale i'm yeah. um, talking of um, selling your practice for a million the uh, nhs practices um, continue to attract more in terms of money than private practices and i think in a way this is related isn't it because um, someone who's buying as a corporate is going to want a practice with a contract attached because there's some certainty about that there's some guarantee of income isn't there providing you can negotiate the transfer of the contract of course but you're far more likely if a surgery has a turnover say of half a million pounds or something if you buy it you're far more likely to realize a similar sort of turnover if it's contract based rather than if it's a private practice and all of the turnover was associated with the former boss who may want to work for you or may not uh, or you know may take his million and a half somewhere else and um, you're left then trying to build up what is effectively a, a private practice where the private practitioner has, has gone AWOL yeah uh, going back to o- Oasis you know uh, the, they can't have uh, a monopoly can they you're not allowed to have a monopoly so it could end up that we we have more corporates popping up smaller corporates um, I think you're going to get Oasis and IDH being the the big main ones. Um, so a supermarket may well launch its own brand chain. I think that 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 that's definitely the way it's going, I mean, isn't it? Well, I think when you say you can't have a monopoly, I think you're right in that you can't 
prevent other companies coming in and stop them starting up but you can get into a situation where you're dominant in the market and if you look at the optical sector for example i mean you can you can count on the fingers of one hand can't you the major players in the optical sector the vision express the optical express spec savers dolans perhaps i don't know if yeah. you can think of any others but um, and then you've got and then you've got all the really really small guys but the the big ones are dominant and I think that they are expecting it to go the same way in dentistry. I think they're expecting. I don't. I think what Oasis and IDH are don't expect to cancel each other out, but I think they do expect to be two of the three or four major players, and they'll dominate because they'll pick up eighty percent of the market. And eighty percent of seven billion quid for them is is a lot of dosh. You know, it's well worth. Um, perhaps it is worth investing in Sir Stuart Rose to uh, get a. Uh, a small, uh, you know, to get eighty percent of that particular pie—that's a lot of uh, money, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good time to be buying shares in any of the corporates, I would think. But that—that's the thing. You—you you do only currently have those two big ones um, in dentistry, so there's room for two or three more, and it'd be interesting to see where they come from. Now. Winding up, the last story I've got down here on the schedule to have a chat about is the Dental Defence Union. And to, for those people who are not familiar with the insurance and sort of indemnity, this is medical indemnity with insurance we're talking about now, which is uh, the, it is compulsory insurance in case you do something which is later decided to be negligent and which causes harm, which then uh, causes you know the, a loss. And that loss is then uh, paid for by your indemnity insurance. So, for example, if you drop a reamer down someone's throat, always used to be a good example. Um, although there's no excuse for that now. They probably wouldn't pay up for that now because you're not really supposed to be working in a way that allow, would allow that to happen. But um, there are three major players uh, that are UK or London-based. That's Dental Protection. Um, um, no, sorry, I think there's two in London. There's Dental Protection and Medical Defence Union in London. And then there's Medical and Dental Defence Union in Scotland. So there, there are three. And um, there are others, um, including, uh, uh, you know, you can go straight to Lloyd's yourself and ask for there, there are medical underwriters at Lloyd's. But they're the three main ones anyway. And they all used to be mutual. In other words, they the members paid into a central fund and then they would then, if they needed to, put a claim in and claim against the fund and providing it got agreed then it would be paid and all the expenses for the lawyers and everything would be paid out of the fund and then a few years ago i think it was around about year 2000 or so um the dental defense union suddenly said no we are going to go to an insurance policy based approach so it's not going there's going to be no mutual fund anymore um we are going to pay a premium to Lloyd's and Lloyd's is going to underwrite everybody and then uh, but it's a marvellous scheme because we'll, you'll all have a policy so you'll all know exactly what is covered and what isn't covered and um, uh, there'll be none of this uh, namby-pamby uh, ambiguity as there is with uh, mutual associations about you know are you going to be covered or not and, and it's because it's discretionary it's always at somebody's discretion um, and they banged on about this for years and years and years, and it turned into a massive bun fight between, I think, basically Rupert Hoppenbrower at the Dental Defence Union and um, Kevin Lewis at Dental Protection, and with MDDUS on their side about what was the best way of doing things. And I think the answer is they they were both reasonably good way of doing things. Possibly um, the problem with the insurance-based model is that more of the members' money leaked out into the pockets of the shareholders and the insurance people who underwrote the insurance than, than the mutual, where obviously it all stayed in-house. But as far as the uh, insurance went, they cost about the same and they did about the same job. But then um, uh, two years ago, this is guy called Finley Scott was asked to review the requirement to have um, indemnity insurance because... It, there was a debate about the new dentists need to be indemnified and the new doctors needed to be indemnified, but then there was a worry that possibly nurses need to be indemnified as well. And he came up, and, um, and you know, I'm a bit um, cynical about the way these things happen, but he, he came up with this uh, recommendation, which is that no, nurses were fine, especially if they were... 
they're working in the health service, they'd be covered by the health service uh, insurance. And if they're working as employees, then basically they, they're pretty unlikely to be sued anyway because employees benefit from something called vicarious liability, which is, means that if they do something negligent, it's assumed that it's their boss's fault. That mm. Their bosses either didn't train them properly or didn't... Um, supervise them properly or didn't give them the right equipment or something so the boss is in trouble and finley scott came up with this independent policy review and said basically um you know nurses don't need don't need it and nobody who's employed needs it nobody who was working for the health service needs it now one upshot of that is that he was asked to look at this question of whether mutual insurance or insurance policy based insurance are well, is is one of them better than the other? And he said, look, I've had a chat with officials. I think that's all he said, just said officials, by which we presume he meant officials in the Department of Health. And they've said to me, uh, we don't care. So it's the same. Six of one, half dozen of the other. It doesn't make any difference to us as long as... Because at that point, really, there were still doctors and dentists who weren't insured. It wasn't necessarily compulsory. It's only recently it's become compulsory. And it's still causes a problem if the dentist moves abroad and uh, Chris Dean I think from Dental Law Partnership is leading a campaign to try and force these indemnifiers to face up to their responsibilities when the um, dentist goes abroad and leaves and, and effectively leaves the patient without any recourse to indemnity even though they may they may have been indemnified and there may be a policy that would pay out but the patient can't find out from the dentist who the insurer is and so the no liability uh, arises but uh, Finley Scott decided that there was there was pretty much no difference and then I think dental defense then said well that's it that he was our last best hope dental defense were trying were hoping that the government would turn around to the discretionary insurers and say no this has to be insurance based and then it would have been a level playing field but seeing that they couldn't play on a level playing field anymore i think uh, dental defense union then finally said well we're going to give in and we're going to go back to a discretionary what's called a discretionary occurrence basis funded by us and so uh, now it's all gone back in house but it doesn't ultimately make any difference if you're a, a customer does it no i don't think so because you still at the end of the day you still pay your money and takes your choice and you, you know you get you get the cover the covers are pretty similar. The premiums are pretty similar. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm a great fan. You know, I mean, you know, the DFO is a mutual association. I'm a great fan of mutual associations, whether it's for pension provision or investments or uh, provident societies, friendly societies, uh, certainly um, income protection, I would say, to any young dentists out there if you've got a choice between a commercial firm where you're paying uh, a premium and you're going to get a certain amount of income protection or uh, versus paying to a mutual you may find that the commercial firms pay more and they pay it more quickly they probably won't pay it for long but they'll probably pay it quicker and they probably give you slightly more and that's superficially that's pretty attractive but in fact, if you pay into a mutual, then you you know you may have to wait longer for the money, and you may get slightly less. But you do, when you're fifty something, get a massive great lump sum, which is equivalent to getting all your premiums back, pretty much. I mean, I can say these things because I'm not an independent financial advisor, mm. and I'm not getting paid for this advice. So I mean, if I'm completely wrong, then it's a shame Rich is not here because he would tell me. I mean but um but i was always I always relied on mutuals for my income protection because i knew that it, i was only lending them the money with a commercial association you're giving them the money but um, yeah. with the mutual you're lending them and it's a shame i don't i think it's a shame because uh, dental protection and mdd us they've probably got billions billions in assets invested to underwrite what they do and yet and and so I think they should start paying out some sort of terminal bonus. I think when you, if you've been a customer of theirs, and you re, you retire, I think you should get a little share, a little bit of a share of the company back because at the moment they're just they just like oh thanks very much that's the members' money we're putting it in and we're keeping it for the members. But when you cease to become a member, you should, 
I don't see why you shouldn't get a bit back, you know, some sort of share. I'm sure they could do that and still maintain sufficient reserves. But at the moment, they're saying, yeah, well, no, it's, that's gone in the reserves. We've had to put that into building up the reserves. Well, I mean, how how many billion pounds do they need? In, are they just saving this money up for the sake of saving it? You know, it gets a bit addictive, I suppose, if you're getting hundreds of millions of pounds in all the time. When is enough enough? When do they say stop? Well, they, they have to employ someone to count all the money, don't they? And if, you know, they, they'd have to sack people, presumably. People would be made redundant. Well, perhaps Something they can like take that. on the people from the BDA that are being made redundant to help them count their money. That is a very good idea. What I'm more concerned about is uh, the the Scott advice. Um, and you mentioned this some years ago to me that you found out dental nurses, as you just mentioned before, dental nurses do not necessarily need indemnity insurance. But is the GDC still telling them that they do? I think the GDC is pretty careful to steer clear of of the argument as to be well let, let me put it this way dental nurses i i am pretty sure and i'm looking for the the reference here and i think it's fairly early on in the review that says that dental nurses are covered by um uh, they're either as i say working for the for the nhs in which case they're covered by nhs indemnity or they're employed now, uh, as a, a self-employed dental nurse wouldn't would need indemnity, but there are very, very few of those. Um, the sort of people that do need indemnity are hygienists, therapists, clinical dental technicians and stuff like that. <clears throat> now, yeah. if you're a dental nurse and you are worried, you know, in, and you've been told, oh, now you're registered with the General Dental Council, you may get reported to the General Dental Council, you may have to appear before the General Dental Council, then... I can see why you might think that you needed some sort of insurance possibly to cover that and, and to pay for representation because you couldn't, you know, pay for a barrister, could you, if you're a dental nurse, to, if you've got, you know, there's a complaint to the... But the thing is that you're... And and I think for a while the um, people like uh, Dental Protection uh, said, look, you know, this is not a problem. If you're a dental nurse working in the practice of a dentist who's a member of ours, then we'll we'll include you in our scope of our advice and care because basically it's going to be the same complaint isn't it i mean the, the complaint will probably be to the dentist and it'll name the nurse but basically we'll, we'll be doing the paperwork anyway so we may as well just uh, we'll put your name down on the list of people that we're representing but mm. um the one association in particular and that's the british association of dental nurses did come up with this scheme whereby they sold nurses in indemnity insurance and um, I've had many a, an argument with um, Pam Swain, their chief executive, about this, and, and also the underwriter, Sharon, who's um, underwrote uh, both um, Shield and uh, for us, and uh, under, I know underwrites the BADN scheme. And it's money for old rope for them because they know damn well that the nurses are not going to get complained about, and they're paying a premium which i you know might be 10 or 15 pounds a year or something but even if it's two pounds a year it's two pounds a year for not much and mm. uh it's and uh, but, the, but the problem is that in the society in which we live that is seen as good business by some people you know uh and and there are an awful lot of nurses and so obviously the numbers multiply the the profits to be made if you can make thirty thousand people pay 10 pounds then you've got three hundred thousand pounds, haven't you? And if you don't have to do much for that, then that's that's good business. Now I would say it's bad business. And whenever the, our nurses members have asked us if they need indemnity insurance, we've always told them no. But you know they're, they're always at the back of their mind that well, perhaps I'll get it just to be on the safe side. Perhaps I'll get it just to be sure. Are you sure? You know, and it's always more difficult to say to someone, no, you don't need something, isn't it? Than to say yes, you do. Because you can't prove the negative. You can't prove to them why they don't need it. All you can do is say that you've looked at the, the Scott Review, which most of them will have never heard of, let alone read, and say, we've looked at it. It's our opinion that you don't need it. And I'm pleased to say that we've never regretted giving that advice. Yeah, but do, does the GDC have any knowledge of the Scott Review? Because according to the GDC website, once registered, 
as a dental care professional, you must have professional indemnity to practice in the UK. And they've helpfully blued out professional indemnity there so you can follow the link. And you click that. Oh, sorry, we couldn't find that page. So I think oh, the GDC... God. Is that the, the GDC, GDC website? It is. It needs to spend a little bit of all that new money it's got on sorting its website out, perhaps. But oh, also, their website is terrible. Th this, this advice is not... It's not right, is it? You, it says you must have professional indemnity to practice in the UK. And as it turns out, that's not exactly true. Well, it says, I'm on the indemnity page, and it says, we expect you to have the appropriate arrangements in place to, in order for patients to seek any compensation which they may be entitled to. Now, if you're uh, vicariously indemnified by your employer, then I would say that's the end of it. Yeah. And what about technicians? Why would a dental technician need indemnity? Would they? Well, as I say, it's really designed to protect you against financial claims which arise out of claims for damage, for loss, as a result of negligence. Now, how many times have technicians had claims of that nature? Probably. It's always the dentist, isn't it? It's the dentist that's yeah. the one that gets sued, isn't it? The denture doesn't fit, the dentist gets sued, you know? Yeah. It's not... Yeah. It, it's a funny, it's a big business, I think, built up uh, around, and I think there's probably a little bit of unscrupulous activity going on, and uh, I think that it needs to be clearer. I think who needs indemnity and who doesn't should be made absolutely clear. I wish I could find this thing in the Scott Review that... Um Hang on a second... Oh, this is dead air, Derek. No, dead well, air. yeah, no. Actually, I've got it. No, it's in, it's uh, conclusions and recommendations number four. It's on top of page four, and it says, um, "My conclusions have taken into account that employees in the National Health Service and independent sector will be able to satisfy the condition of registration by dint of the corporate cover that arises from an employer's vicarious liability." for the acts or omissions of employees. So basically that's the employer's fault. You know, it's like, you know, whatever goes wrong, it's my fault around here. Whatever goes wrong with a nurse, it's the nurse's employer's fault. It says personal cover from a defence organisation, trade union or other body will not be required in relation to practice as an employee. So that's yeah. it. No, as an employee, completely covered. Personal okay. cover will only be required in relation to self-employed practice. In my judgment, this is the correct approach. So this this could be like the mis-selling of PPI. You know, you'll get some... <gasps> oh. <laughs> I hadn't thought <laughs> of could, it like that. You could get some, some recorded voice on the end of your phone, you know, saying, press 5 now and well, we'll... Well, you mis-sold indemnity insurance by the BADN. Yeah, I, I, well, and Holy everybody cow. else. Holy Everybody cow. Else. You didn't hear I mean, it from that, us, okay? This is what it boils down to. This could be a PPI scandal in dentistry. And do you know How that? about that? It hadn't even occurred to me that. And I've been banging on about this for years. Well, you just need to talk to someone clever occasionally, that's all. Do you know I think what they'll say, they'll say they'll say that even if you are covered by vicarious liability, you might still need someone to represent your interests and help you handle the correspondence and everything and then that's what we would do oh well okay well that, that seems like a fairly good note to end on <laughs> <laughs> we'll be talking to pam swain next time of course pam swain will be a guest on the on the next netcast no doubt explaining what she's spent all the money on <laughs> buying a... buying richard lishman a new car perhaps right that Yes. I, uh, well, no, we need to wind it up now because I think it's. Um, I'll just about have enough time to cobble all this together. The, uh, as I say, the video is working again this week, so that's great. Um, we might uh, have this out on YouTube as well as uh, as a netcast, a podcast. We're going to the BDTA this now. I've got a problem because Faraday is stuck in Iran, and oh. she, my staff, my staff is stuck in foreign climes. 
and therefore cannot man, personnel, workforce, whatever the word is, stand. So um, I don't know what I'm going to do. Ask me ne uh, the next podcast how I've coped because I've got to do three day exhibition and there's nobody to help me. Oh, diddums. <sighs> So um, probably, I don't think, by the time most people listen to this, the exhibition will be over anyway, so they don't care. But, Does anyone uh, care? But <laughs> if you do, if you do, if you are listening to this in the two or three days before the BDTA, it's the 17th and 19th October, we're on stand R10J. Um, now the next netcast is going to be on Monday the 4th of November, that's the day before Bonfire Day, and... As usual, if you need anything, just uh, either email us at info at dentalfusion.org or go to the website dentalfusion.org. If you're a member, you'll be able to get in. If you're uh, not a member, there's still some stuff on there for you, but uh, including uh, the address of the podcast and stuff like that. But please do consider joining because we have for many years relied on the support of the profession to keep going. And we, unlike the British Dental Association, we don't have much in the way of reserves and we do need your help and support more than ever. So go and have a look, see what we offer. If you think it's worth um, worth what we're charging for it, then sign up and uh, try us out. So I think that's it. Anything else? No, I was just going to suggest that as it's the day before bonfire night, we could have a mass burning of all the indemnity certificates. <laughs> yes. Yes, well, there's going to be a mass burning of Lishman unless we find out that he's got a bloody good excuse for not being on this week. Yeah. But um, yeah. as you say, I think he did mention that he wasn't going to be around one week. And this is... Uh, this is that week. Possibly he's taken his bloody... Eighty-one thousand pound Mercedes abroad, isn't he? He's gone on a driving holiday, isn't he? Probably. Well, that man seems to take holiday every week. Just don't know what's going on. Shocking. We have to work for a living. He's some sort of playboy, gallivanting round Europe. I don't, I don't know. think he's doing his image. First of all, can I just say, if you're invited to be a presenter on this podcast and you don't turn up, expect to have the piss taken out of you mercilessly. That is one of the conditions. If I ever miss one of these, or if, if uh, and Chris has certainly missed these in the past, that is just a condition of joining in. Yeah, that's fair. And secondly, anyway. um, yeah, no, well, well firstly, is another. No, there is no secondly. Secondly, thirdly. Secondly, read rule one. Thirdly, I'm hungry. Thanks very much. All right, Chris, talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.